The Tim Hill Podcasts. Ordinary people's extraordinary stories. Welcome to the Tim Hill Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to have a chat with Adam. Adam, if you can tell me when and where you were born, and if you can describe what it was like where you grew up and the schools you went to and the education that you received. So, yeah, let's do it. Um, I was born in Utah on a polygamous colony, a subsect of Mormonism. And it was in the middle of nowhere because in Utah, it's still illegal to practice polygamy. So the family had to move to some uh, to some place totally off the grid where they had a generator, their own gardens. We milked our goats and everything in between. Um, so that's how, and this was in 1981 when I was born and, and, uh, side note, I bought a 1981 CJ five, an old, uh, Jeep. Uh, so, <laughs> which is, which is kind of fun. I was like, I didn't think I'd ever find one with the same year that I was born, but I found one. So I had to buy it. Uh, but when I was, Good. when I was growing up for the first couple of years, they didn't really have schools. It was like homeschooling. And then when my mom decided to uh, to leave that that thing. So I grew up in other parts of Utah and um, with a single mom, she was she went to computer programming and things like that. I was a problem child, which is interesting. So I went to a lot of elementaries. You asked, what was it like going to elementary? We had good elementaries. Um, in Granite School District in Salt Lake City and a couple other districts of in the Salt Lake area and, and in and around there. Um, and I kept getting in fights. And so they kept kicking me out of the school. So mm. I, I, was, I was that problem child that uh, no parent wishes that every parent <laughs> hopes not to have. And I, you know, I, I did that to my mom. Uh, mm. I don't know so, what was can- going. Yeah, go ahead. Can, can I just take you back a little bit? You, sure. you said that you, you were born into a uh, into a polygamy. Yeah. That's like having two or three wives, is it? Yes. Uh, so my mother was the sixth out of six wives. Um, oh, I have 20 brothers and sisters. And um, in fact, it's, it's funny because this week I'll be in Napa. I head out tomorrow. And the following week is a family reunion, and it's going to be with my biological dad and all the other wives and, and kids, so I'm going to be able to see a lot of them. But I kind of became distanced from them uh, over the years. There wasn't really Facebook for a lot of those years, and then there became mm-hmm. Facebook, but not all of that family uh, was was getting on Facebook at the beginning and all that. So one of my sisters who I've never met, she's at least 15 years older than me. Um, she reached out and sent me a private a, a private message on Facebook and saying, hey, we're having this giant family reunion. Do you want to come? And I'm like, yeah, so I'm going to bring my mountain bike <laughs> and my my other Jeep. I've got a a Jeep that I just bought. It's the JL. Um, but I'm going to head out there to this middle of nowhere, Utah, close to where I grew up and, uh, and reconnect with some people I haven't seen since I was about three years old. So. Crikey. Oh, that, that sounds like it, it's, it sounds like it could be a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> I'm looking and, forward uh, to it. So with schools, I got kicked out of a lot of schools, but the the schools were decent in Utah uh, growing up. Um, But I went to a lot of elementaries and I I kept getting kicked out so many times. Um, Different. um, What what, what are those called? Um, Child care centers as well. So like where you would go after school while your parents are both at work. Uh, Anyway, growing up, I, I ended up staying in utah most of my years i live in colorado now um i've got two kids of my own and where i went to i graduated high school in kaysville utah which is north of salt lake and then i uh graduated college 
in um, Orem, Utah. Uh, so that's a little bit about school. And I'll let you mm. ask if there's anything that I that I missed. I think there's an awful lot that you missed, actually. Okay, okay. So let's 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 take you 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 back to where what age were you when your mother left the the community? I guess I was a I was three years old, almost four, and I ended up having my fourth birthday with my grandma. Uh, the I was already a problem child at three or four, so the the other moms were like, uh, "We can't handle this guy." Uh, <laughs> we, but my mom, my own mother, she was, she had just gotten into college and she hadn't, uh, she wasn't on her feet all the way yet. So, um, she was still very young. She was 19 when she got married. And, uh, and so she was still just like a kid, but she had her kids. Mm -hmm. So we stayed with my grandma for a few months and I had my fourth birthday with my grandmother before. Uh, starting out grade school um, in Salt Lake with my mom. Yeah. Can you remember much of that sort of time then? I remember some things. I remember st st uh, stepping on an anthill and getting bit by ants. I remember the garden. I remember <laughs> uh, the swing set. And I remember um, just how it was all laid out. There were seven trailers. And um, one one where bio dad would be and then one for every wife. And um, and and there was nobody else that lived there. Um, so I remember just what it looked like. And I, and I also recall a day that we lost power and we went to the generator, which must have been it was fenced in. So, it, but I was small back then, so I don't want to say it's, you know, like that ant hill that I told yeah. you I stepped on. Yeah, I remember it being three feet tall. My mom says it was about <laughs> eight inches tall. Um, so, so going to this generator, I remember a fenced-in area. My my mind's telling me it was something like uh, eight by ten, something like that. A mm -hmm. fenced-in area that had a, a generator in there, but um. The, I, I, I remember that it might have been smaller than I'm that I'm imagining. And the only other thing that I remember while out there, uh, two more things. One is uh, I was about three years old and one of my brothers told me to grab some candy off of the top of a piano. So I climbed up on the bench and reached up and I got my finger slapped with a uh, with a, a mouse trap that he had put up there to jokingly. <laughs> It hurt like heck. I definitely remember that. And I remember drinking water or milk. It would have been, probably been goat milk because we milked our own goats out there. But I was drinking something. I think it was milk. And when I was drinking it, I was about two years old and I was making this sound. And my, my biological father, it drove him nuts, that noise. But I couldn't figure out how to stop it. I didn't know how to drink without making that sound. But I, I remember he was like mad at me, like, uh, you know, in a good, in a nice way. He's like, Hey, st can't you do that? And I couldn't figure it out at two years old, how to drink the milk without, mm. uh, without making a <laughs> gulping sound. <laughs> so, so your grandmother then was, was she, um, your mother's mother or yes. Yeah. Yeah. And she, she was living out in the commune as well? No. She, at the time, she was part of the same church, but um, she didn't she didn't live there. She lived maybe 20 miles away hmm. uh, in a mo like a more traditional neighborhood of St. George. Yeah. So you moved out with, with your, your grandmother and then you moved off from there to, to Salt Lake City. Yes. So you spent a lot of time in sort of after school childcare um, because your mother was, was it, I guess, college, was she? Yeah, she was going to college um, for computer programming at the time. And um, barely making ends meet as a single mom. Uh, we were on food stamps. Though I don't know if they have those all around the world, but in the U.S., uh, food stamps 
is basically the government paying for your food. So you, you pay for the mm -hmm. food, but with, uh, with vouchers instead of with cash. Yeah. Um, so that's how poor we were growing up is we needed those. Um, anyway, anyway, yeah, I don't want to go off of too many tangents. I want to answer your questions. Okay. So, um, you, you you really struggled going through school then. Why why do you think it was that you kept getting into punch ups? Why did you get in fights? I was one of the smallest kids. Absolutely by far one of the strongest kids, but I was very small and I was kind of a weirdo. Um so when I say that I have been diagnosed with autism which is a mild form of autism, which used to be called Asperger's, but uh, mm -hmm. no longer exists. They just say you're on the spectrum. So um, when a normal human without uh, autism would take the autism test, they would probably score a two or a three. Most human mm -hmm. beings would probably score a two or a three. Severe autism is, you know, in the 80s, 90s. And uh, me, as well as a son of mine, we are in the 30s. Uh, so I think I mm. score 36 out of uh, 100. But it means that I don't understand sarcasm the same as other people. And I don't, when somebody's joking with me, oftentimes I think that they're telling me a story. And so I'll look at them like a deer with, in the headlights. I'll be confused. I'll be like, what are you trying to say? Like, are you, are you joking? Um, because I don't naturally get that. I, I, I have a dry sense of humor myself. I think I'm funny as heck, but, um, but I don't, I'm, I don't quite know how to take other people when they're joking with me. I'm not, I'm like, what are you, are you serious? Are you joking? And that comes from the autism. Other things that came from that is and i'm dyslexic as well so reading is horrible so i got made fun of for my size yeah. i got fun of because i couldn't read i got fun of because i was the best at math and and that hurt people's feelings that i was better at them at, at math um so i would i would get bullied and the me getting in fights was me retaliating and feeling with bully and yeah, yeah. And for them, or I would, I would protect somebody else who was small and getting picked on, but I was so strong it, when I was that small, I broke people's fingers, people's ribs. I shattered somebody's testicles. Uh, and, uh, I, I broke somebody's nose as well. Like a couple of fingers, a couple of ribs, one nose, one testicle. <laughs> And I was just this teeny tiny kid that felt like if if we were in a fight, if we were in a verbal fight and you still didn't believe me, what I was saying, if I beat you up, you believe me now. Like <laughs> I'm I'm right because I was stronger or yeah. or um, yeah, I just I had a hard time controlling the, the my emotions i didn't know how to communicate like to speak and communicate my emotions I, I went straight to frustration anger violence which is funny because no you know my my mom was always patient with me uh my bio dad the only bad thing i ever remember is him not understanding that i couldn't gulp so like Everybody in my life was kind and patient and thoughtful, but I mm. was this kid who just didn't know himself. I was dyslexic and autistic and just a weirdo who would be by myself on the playground counting uh, how many how many um, rings there were, counting how many blades of grass there were that I could find, counting how many yellow ones I could find, uh, trying to go on the monkey bars and by myself and skip. I wanted to skip one monkey bar each time. I wanted to skip two <laughs> monkey bars now that I was getting a bigger reach. 
and um, I was I would play in the mud and just draw things, and my brain just worked a little bit differently. And I it uh, and being as small as I was, it allowed me to get picked on. But uh, through sixth grade, I I just kept beating. I kept like using violence. Uh, there was this guy named Marcy. Uh, nobody should name their their son Marcy. It's a <laughs> it's a strange name. But uh, this guy like named Marcy. Oh, boy, is, so in it. He yeah, he's a giant. This guy. We were in sixth grade, and I was I was one of the absolute smallest kids in our, our sixth grade class. Marcy was Marcy looked like a high school kid in sixth grade, and like he always wore Raiders jerseys. And Raiders is uh, the yeah. Los Angeles, or I think they moved yeah. a couple of times. Oakland but Raiders, back Oakland then, now, yes, Oakland. So so he would always wear Raiders jerseys, and we were all playing basketball. And, uh, Marcy, <laughs> Marcy, um, fouled me and I, w I was calling the foul and he's like, that's not a foul. And then he, he's put me in a headlock and punched me in the head a whole bunch of times. <laughs> and I was just laughing at him. I was like, Marcy, you're such a wuss. Doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt. And he just kept hitting me in the face as hard as he could. Like while I was in a headlock and I'm just laughing my a off and making the entire school just come and look at this. And, uh, and I'm like, can, do you want me to show you how to hit Marcy? Do you want me to show you how to hit? None of that hurts. That's not doing anything to me. And, uh, so this giant of a man in sixth grade, I finally get out of his headlock. I punch him one time in the ear recess ends. I got called out by the principal. <laughs> the principal came and um, I was brand new to the, the I hadn't gone to this school. I just started in sixth grade in the middle of the year because I had gotten kicked out of my last school. So I was so brand new. Nobody knew me. And uh, and I was so small. Nobody would have expected this. But Marcy went to the office, got an ice pack for his ear, cried to the to the principal. <laughs> and the principal came and got me. And I'm thinking to myself, Oh, the principal just wants me to verify that Marcy hit me like a million times. <laughs> and instead, I got suspended. Marcy didn't. And uh, but at least I got a few friends that that saw me not take anything from from the bully. Um, and so I got a little bit of a respect as a brand new uh, student to that school. Anyway, uh, this type of thing happened a lot there. There was when I was in second grade, there was um, there was a couple of sixth graders beating up uh, another second grader. And uh, this was at a totally different school in Salt Lake City. And uh, and so I beat up the two sixth graders that were that were trying to fight this other second grader because I just I thought it was unfair. And I don't know where I got my strength or from or my drive or the ability not to be able to feel other punches, but I got it from somewhere. And, uh, and, and I, I'm not, it sounds like I'm proud of it. I'm sure on this, but I never think about or talk about this stuff. It just came up because you had me talking about, you know, my or, or origination stories, but, uh, this is, this is stuff that never comes up, but I, I do think it's, I do think it's funny. I, I used to, I used to resort to violence, uh, a, a lot, but for the most part, to protect myself or to pr protect somebody else, usually. Mm. Well, this is important stuff. So, what happened when you got beyond sixth grade? Then, did you did you kind of work it out and ease off a bit, or did you just carry on thumping people when they yes. needed it? No, I I stopped. Um, I in seventh grade, I got in one fight and and i and i cut and i stopped the fight um but i've never never been violent with anyone since so you kind of learned a lesson there then to yeah to control it yeah and how did, yeah, how, did, how did it progress yeah how did it progress through sort of the eighth and ninth grade then well in seventh eighth and ninth grade I got on the track and field team, um, wrestling team, 
and I was in band. And I started composing music in uh, seventh or eighth grade. And I, I composed some music. And this is probably because of autism, uh, Asperger's. It's like almost like in a way a savant, like a kid who it could be terrible at a lot of things, but especially good at, at you know, one mm -hmm. or two things. And for me in sixth grade, at the end of sixth grade, as I was getting placed into junior high for seventh, eighth and ninth, um, they had me take these tests and uh, my math, I was doing high school and college math in my head in sixth grade, like without ever being taught what some of those uh, algebra and geometry were. I had never seen it, but it just made so much sense. It was so mm -hmm. conceptual. Like I, I didn't, I didn't need to write down anything or 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 anything so so like anyway i place and and i'm they i have to get all of these iq tests and apparently my iq is really high even though i can't hardly read and and there's a lot of other things that i can't really do but um point is that that i took all these tests and and when i got into seventh grade my plan was to really change my life around. I was on ADHD medicine, Ritalin, Dextrin, and some other uh, medicines that I really hated taking. And it made me feel even more uh, isolated when I had to go to the principal's office once a day in the afternoon to take my afternoon pill. They had mm -hmm. to hold my prescriptions there. And so it was like we would I would get paged to the office once a, once a day in grade school. Can you send Adam Adams to the office to take his pills? And I I looked around at my class of 30 something people and and I just felt Nobody like I was the only me. one who did it. And it's just another thing. And also the Ritalin made me feel kind of like heart racy, a little bit mm. stressed out. And and the Ritalin might be part of could be i'm not saying it is could be part of the resorting to violence because it can get you it can get you feeling a little um anxious and so the stress would be a little bit more overwhelming while you're on that drug um anyway it, it probably did for me if it if if it the science doesn't mm. show that it does it for everybody i think it had something so when I was going into seventh grade, I was like, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to, I don't want to have to take it. So I, A, tried to prove to my mom that I could handle myself without it. And B, I started doing uh, track and field uh, wrestling and band and composing music in, in, and this kind of gave me these outlets and the, uh, uh, some friends and I feel like seventh grade organically helped me as a person because I could immerse myself in music and I could challenge myself to get as many school records as I could. I was a pretty fast kid. When I was growing up and living in Salt Lake, we didn't own a car. We were on food stamps and my mom also couldn't afford to, a, a vehicle. So we would we would walk like eight miles a day pretty, pretty regularly. We were walking every single day from like that was how she dropped me off at school. That was how she picked me up from school. That's how or picked me up from the daycare. That's how I, I would take a bus from school to daycare. But anyway, I ended up being really fast, probably because of all the walking that we had to do. I was on my mm. feet more than most kids. Um, and I, I have a determination in my brain that I'm uh, not, you can't, I can't, I won't let, I won't back down. So anyway, <laughs> I, I started wrestling and I, I got really good at wrestling. I got really good at music and I started setting school records in the track and field in. And uh, so basically my, my habits, my, my thoughts, my, uh, it started changing. I started making more friends and uh, I started growing up and I was no longer on the medicine and um, and I had a reason to to, you know, be happy in a way. Mm. 
So what sort of music were you into? What? I would, I usually listen to Baroque music. Um, uh, Vivaldi and Bach are my two favorites. And the music that I would write and compose. Uh, by the way, I did have an opportunity to compose a symphony for my school. And we played it when I was an eighth grader. Um, and one of the, uh, anyway, my college, in college, when I got to college, and we had a, they had a composer, a student composer thing. Um, I played some, I, I went and got the woodwind quintet that uh, it's a thing that I wrote. It sounds mm -hmm. very Baroque music, like classical music, pre-classical. Um, but anyway, there was this piece that I had written when I was about 13 years old that I was like, you know what, this will be an easy one because I've got friends that, that are, it's a, just a quintet. So it's just five parts. Mm. And I've got friends that play these really, really well. And I wrote this when I was a kid, so the music's going to be a little bit more simple. But I took no, I took first place in a in a student composing composition, using a piece that I had written uh, tw ten years earlier, like when I was still in 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 uh, junior high. But that was the kind of music that I loved. I loved classical music, uh, Mozart, but most especially uh, mm -hmm. Baroque music like Vivaldi and, and Bach. Yeah. So my favourite piece of music is uh, Romance of the Gadfly by Shostakovich. Okay. And I, that, that's that, is, that's probably awesome comes from the Romantic era, right after yeah. the classical. Yeah. yeah I, I don't know why, but it's there's something, maybe it's with the autism, who knows, but there's something mm. with the structure of like Baroque music that really makes my brain happy. Uh, once you get into like the classical, uh, it starts to push those limits a little bit, but the romantic era, uh, pushed them even more so much so that I always like stayed far away from the romantic era. I remember I was in university trying to, I was graduating with a music education degree because I was going to teach music. I never did. Um, I ended up doing some other things. But I wanted to teach music. And when we were doing music history and we, no offense, Tim, when we had to listen to the Romantic era, <laughs> I did it grudgingly. Fair one. <laughs> so going through university then, you, that was obviously a major in music. Yeah, did music you, did education. You, did you mind or anything? No, I, I switched my major a lot of times, though. So I was in I was in college for seven years to get my degree. Uh, and it, I did not get a law degree. I did not get a doctor degree. Um, you must have loved school. I did not even get a master's degree. Um, so so, yeah, I just I, I found I, I broke the curve in the accounting program. So the college that I was going to as one of the top accounting schools in the nation. So it's really hard to do, but I got an A++ in that class because I did some extra credit and I got a perfect A on everything else because accounting is just math. It's like, yeah, it's no problem. And, um, and apparently I broke the curve in all three of the classes for uh, accounting 20, 2010 or whatever they call it, 2010. It's like a 201 uh, mm -hmm. version. And, uh, and, but I, so I was like, man, I guess I'm pretty good at accounting, uh, because I got the highest score out of three different classes that this person teaches and I'm the new a, so instead of the normal a for when you have a yeah. curve, it's like 92% is an a, but I got 104%, uh, because I, I did a, like a little bit more and it made other people fail more, you know, it, it hurt everybody else because i got such a high grade uh um, that made you popular <laughs> uh well in my own class it did i started doing um tutoring for a couple of the women that were in that class um they were like how are you doing this what do you do and i would sit down with them and i love to teach i was going to school for music mm -hmm. ed partly because i like to teach so it was a honor to pour into these women and just kind of share with with them how I'm thinking of it because I use patterns to 
to, I, I find patterns and I use those. And a lot of people just aren't naturally seeing the pattern. And so I would share it with the way that I think I would, I would just go, this is kind of how I think about it through this process and get this answer. And it helped. And they, they ended up getting in our class, at least, I don't know against the other three classes, they ended up becoming the second and third grade, th the, the top. I was the first person. And then these two people that I tutored, <laughs> uh, they were number two and number three in the class. Uh, just because I think how I taught them, the way that the way that they mm. were learning it was uh, not the way that the teacher was saying, but the way that I had to figure out on my own. Uh, anyway, that partially answers your question. So, uh, no, I didn't have a minor, but I, I did business for a while. I did construction for a while. And um, and I went back to music ed because I could get my degree faster by just staying with music ed. I finally went to the counselor. And I was like, hey, I've kind of been in school for six years now. And why don't I have a degree? And they're like, let me see your transcripts. By the way, I never knew this stuff. I never knew. My mom no, never told me. I had taken a crap ton of electives, fun classes, but more school than almost anybody with a, a degree that's not a, 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 a master's degree or plus. But they said, you're going to have to do two more semesters if you want to graduate. And I looked at the thing. Look how many freaking credits I've, I've been taking. Uh, I don't know why I did this to myself, but I took 18 credits because I had a scholarship. I played tuba and it allowed me to have all of my school paid for. Um, and so I was just like lallygagging, I guess, without a plan. It just going to school and at my sixth year i'm like can i not f and graduate and they said you need it the fastest way for you to graduate is to do this and you can't take these two classes concurrently so you'd have to take them consecutive you'd have to take one this semester and one the or next semester and one the following semester i'm like i still have another year and i've been going to school for six years already so i end up graduating seven years of school and I took 18 credits almost, almost always. I all nearly was always taking 18 credits um, except for these so, last two semesters where I, I took the minimum, which was like, I don't know, 10 credits or something that whatever the minimum was that my scholarship would let me do. I just took the minimum. So I had a, a few more electives and these two classes that I had to take consecutively. So let me get this right. So you were the smallest kid in this, in, the, in your early years, and then you're playing a tuba. So did you grow up a bit? Uh, no, because I was. Because a tuba is like a, a huge, I mean, did, did you have to put it on a wheelbarrow I, and carry it around? Or I didn't or? <laughs> grow until the end of high school, and I only grew tall at the end of high school. So... I got up to about 5'11", and this was with my last, my 10th grade, my, my 11th grade, my 12th grade. I went from, you know, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, to like 5'11 and a half when I graduated. And, but I was 152 pounds when I graduated at 5'11 and a half. So that's really thin, really, mm. really, really thin. And then I did a, a mission for two years serving in Los Angeles, and I ate a crap ton of food. We served with all the Samoans, the the Tongans, the 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 Hawaiians, the uh, the Mexicans, the all of these different cultures were were there and making us tons of food, especially Tonga and Samoa. Uh, these two yeah. places they want to they want to help out the missionaries. So we would actually we would actually have a huge breakfast, a huge lunch, and a huge dinner because we would just be visiting uh, members of that church and they always wanted to feed us. So anyway, I gained, uh, I gained over 50 pounds. So I got up to 200 pounds and about six feet tall when I was finished with my two-year mission. And today, today I'm six feet and uh, about 175 pounds. So I'm somewhere in the middle. 
but mm-hmm. uh, no, I was I was very short and and very light, and uh, I chose tuba because it was the only one that was it was so big. I I I don't know. You know the have you ever heard those um, big truck syndrome? How guys sometimes the small runt drives yeah. the giant truck that's lifted, <laughs> and it 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 says something about them. That's what I think playing the tuba said about me. It was me overcompensating for my uh, small stature. Yeah. <laughs> so you kind of grew into the tuba then. Uh, I I. Yes, it was always very, very heavy, but I was a strong kid. I, I, I still am quite strong. It's funny because I'm, I don't look very big. I'm only 175 pounds, but when I go to a CrossFit class, um, I'm usually bottom four in endurance, like mm-hmm. the stuff that gets you winded, but I'm normally top two. It for the strength. the strength stuff, like so, whatever I can shoulder press, whatever the mm. high box jumps, walking on my hands, I've just got some strange, uh, freakish uh, muscle <laughs> that it doesn't look that big, but it, uh, but I can put some, move some weight. Mm. So, when you finally graduated college, then <laughs> what was your first job you did? I like how you said that. Um, well, in element in elementary i was watering trees for my dad and so i had i had been getting paid for my stepdad excuse me my stepdad is a is a landscaper and a, he owns a business a um, landscaping company and a nursery so uh, i did that a lot and i did some restaurants but first out of college i already owned a business that was a handyman company and I ha- owned real estate. So I started doing real estate investing because my dad, my, bi- my stepdad, um, uh, always told me that I needed to do real estate investing. So I was working for myself in college, which is actually why I never used my degree. I mm. ha- never needed my degree because what I was doing, I felt like I sold a piece of real estate while before I graduated. And I made the same amount that I would make in an entire year of teaching. And I also, like my handyman company, I was netting 20000 a month, which in the U.S. and especially back then uh, was uh, a heck of a lot of money. Even some doctors and attorneys today mm-hmm. don't make 20000 a month. And, and I was netting that as a, as a kid. Um, so... My first job out of college, I, I didn't really get a job. I just had my my business, and I just managed my business, my real estate portfolio, and I've I've grown that stuff. Um, my I have currently got about three hundred uh, rental units, and um, and I've just still have a, a business, and my business has thirty uh, something employees, probably thirty two today, uh, as we record this. Um, and so, yeah, I've just never really had a job. I've just ran my own stuff. Just work for yourself. Wicked. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But but before that I did work, I did do like bartending. Uh, I did wait service, service staff at a restaurant. Um, but other than that, I, I've been running uh, either. I had a handyman company for a while and, then it was just my real estate company only. And now it's, I do real estate, but I also have a podcast agency. So we serve uh, about 60 podcasters and help them grow their podcasts and things like that. Oh, well, so let's have a look at that then. So how did you get into the podcasting game to start with? What, uh, what you into? Yeah. In 2016, I, it was, I first moved to Denver and I was told that your network is your net worth. You've probably heard that before, Tim, haven't you? Mm-hmm. So, so I realized that I didn't know anybody in Denver. So I said, I'm screwed. If your network is your net worth, I'm screwed. So I decided to grow my uh, network by having a meetup group. 
and having a podcast. The meetup group ended up doing really well and uh, meetup headquarters ended up flying me out to speak for their top 150 meetup groups in the world. And uh, I really love that. That helped a lot. And at the same time, I was launching a podcast, which was didn't take off as fast. Um, and I started helping friends just the way that I did teach those two women that were in our, our, um, our accounting class. I started helping friends be like, this is what I think I did wrong. Here's the pattern that I think you need to follow. Here's the process that you, you're going to need to do when you launch your show. I started having a bunch of friends getting top podcasts right off the bat. They were getting in new and noteworthy. They were getting top 10 in multiple categories. Um, and in the first few weeks of launching. And so I just kept help, helping people for free just because they were my friends and never thinking about like launching an agency. And I grew my podcast and sold it in 2020. So after a, after about 400 episodes, I sold it. That that shows now at 600 episodes. But I had I, I sold the podcast to this guy, and I said I am going to. It was 20 uh, 2020. I said I'm going to focus more on helping other podcasters. Like I really feel like I've got this down uh, packed. Um, I have been helping people since 2017. I started taking money for it in July of 19. But in uh, 2020, I was like, this is what I'm passionate about. You know, like I, I like real estate. I'm, I, I think real estate does a lot, but I don't have to work for my real estate anymore because I already own the units and they just pay me the, the passive cash flow. Um, so not that I was retired. I don't want to say I was retired. <laughs> I never had a retirement party, but, um, but I was set in money and I was fine and I was happy, but I was like, I'm passionate about helping people with podcasts. So I'm going to, I'm going to help as many people as I can. So, um, I really amplified that in, in 2020. Um, and, we do like marketing for people like the, all the paid advertising for podcasts and we do, uh, editing post-production. We write the show notes. We basically try to make it so that podcasters don't have to do anything at all. And my team handles everything else. Hmm. Well, so I, I guess 2020 going into lockdown selling your podcast at that stage must have been a reasonably good move i mean how did you what was the podcast about it was called creative real estate and um it was about being able to do deals outside the box if you don't have money if you do if you don't know how to access the money if you uh yeah just anything creative in real estate uh, to pay less in taxes and things like that. Mm. So that's what it was about. And I really just, it wasn't serving my business. Um, but it was a great podcast. So I didn't want to just quit it. I wanted to give it to a better family, like, uh, mm. uh give it like an adoption. You know, I wanted to make sure that it, <laughs> it had a, had a good family to take care of it. It had a good host to be able to, put out the, the, you know, I got four offers for the, for selling the podcast and I went with the cheapest offer. The hmm. other three, one of them was $60,000, um, 54,000 and 50,000. I didn't, I didn't end up selling it for any of that. I sold it for a lot less because I cared more about my listener who, who, was involved yeah. and i felt like the you know the 50 and 60 thousand dollar offers were coming from somebody not to offend them especially if they're listening but somebody who cared more about the people on the other end than they cared about their pocketbook and mm. they i feel like these three 
mostly saw dollar signs, mostly saw that, that, you know, we had it, not even a ton, but 3,500 people at the time downloading every episode. It's like, that's a massive conference three times mm. a week. That's a massive conference three times a week. And I think that they saw the dollar signs, like I know how to monetize this. So they yeah. wanted to buy it and they wanted to buy it for a fair enough amount of money, but I sold it to this other guy for, I don't even remember the price. It was just, but anyway, the point is a lot less. And, um, I sold it to him because like, I felt like he would take care of my, my listener better. Hmm. And did he? He did for a while. And now, now he's having a hard time putting out episodes. Uh, he's, hmm. he's really, really, really busy. And, uh, I've recorded a few episodes for it, that, that podcast. And I'm like, this is Adam A. Adams filling in for Jason Lewis. And, uh, and then I would just share all of the whatever I wanted to teach. And I'll, and then I would say something like, uh, you should hear Jason on the next episode. Uh, but he he's skipped a few because he's so busy. I've recorded a few. But yeah, he's mm -hmm. he cares about them uh, deeply. Um, he he's staying quite busy. But I would say I would say the answer is yes. He's he's done a, a very good job. Mm. So I must make you pleased that you made the right decision there then. Uh, you know what? I can't answer that. Uh, I can't <laughs> honestly say yes. I don't know. I don't know if I did it over again, if I would just take the, the 60 grand, you know, mm. just, I'm not sure. Okay. I mean, I'm happy with him and I'm happy with what he's yeah. done. But if I, if I, knowing what I know now, knowing that he might eventually slack off after some time, I, I don't know. Maybe I would have just said, screw it. I'm just going to take the, I'm just going to take the highest offer. Who knows? Mm. I'm not, I'm not sure if, if you're asking me honestly. So looking at what you're doing nowadays, how did you start in? doing it for other people how did you get your yeah. first your step, first client step one in getting the first clients is that i private messaged on facebook about 10 friends that i knew that had podcasts that i had been featured on their show they had been featured on my show we had a relationship we might have been in the same mastermind group, paying for the same uh, group uh, coaching program type of thing. And um, and I just private messaged them and said, hey, um, I want to start. This is July of 2019. I said, hey, I want to start um, offering editing and post-production for podcasters would you be open? I, I think I can offer it for less than you're paying. Would you be open to having a conversation? So it was very short, very sweet. And I sent it to maybe like 10 people and four of them became clients, uh, within a week, maybe two. And, um, and that's how we started. That's how we launched. And, as we learned with through growing pains of getting those clients and uh, starting to serve them, we learned a lot. We hired a couple of people and we were no longer making money because we had hired more than the four people would even cost. So mm -hmm. it was like, all right, now that it's 2020, it's time to it's time to grow this so that we can sustain the company. Cause in the beginning, it was basically breaking even it was all of my stuff was being handled basically for free because it was being paid for by all these clients, but we weren't, it, we weren't profitable, you, you know, for the first like five, five or six months, we, we were just sustainable. Mm -hmm. Um, and so to get more clients, what I ended up doing is, uh, I put out a social media post 
that said that was basically a uh, uh what do they call those things um call to action that's not the term that I was looking for, although it did also have a CTA on it attached to it. Um, a case study, Mm. a case study. So I put out uh, on social media, a case study of a couple of clients. And then it had a call to action. Like you said, that basically just mentioned if you're, if you're struggling with your podcast, you know, feel free to let us know we can help. And I got a few more clients and then uh, tick, not TikTok. What is that? Uh, Clubhouse. Clubhouse came around, and um, I started just con- being a contributor on Clubhouse. So I'd host some rooms, and I would be invited on s- virtual stage of other people's rooms on Clubhouse. And you know, I just decided to pour into people, and to to never have like an agenda, but just to help. And it built my name and reputation in the podcasting space very, very quickly by being a thought leader on Clubhouse. I don't I haven't been on Clubhouse for probably about two years now. I haven't even ever haven't touched it. Um, I'm not even sure it's still a thing, is it? it it's it's still available. They, it still happens. But um, but anyway, that that really amplified who we had. Because I would, you know, be talking in front of 50 people or 700 people or 3,000 people being invited on different people's stages because it's so incestual, like thought leadership is. And mm. Clubhouse is just the same, whereas the, it's the same good old boys club that keep getting invited on different stages because they're the same rec- names that keep getting recognized. And with a name like Adam Adams very recognizable mm. you yeah. you can't forget that and so i just kept being invited on different stages and contributing from my heart just value and kept getting people um reaching out to me saying i want i can you help me with this can you help me with this so that really blew up the company where we got like uh, 35 clients in the first like three or four months of clubhouse um that really made a huge huge difference and now uh, i do this thing that i call jab jab right hook um i coined from gary vaynerchuk's book jab jab right hook where he talks a lot about uh spending some time doing the quick punches on social media and even when he wanted to published that book he wanted there to be a lot more jabs in the title like 100 jabs and then one right hook because of the way he thinks of it but i have implemented that in my social media strategy and it helps me continue to gain clients at a pace that is plenty like i sometimes i'm i I don't hardly advertise uh anything because that company grows fairly organically and through the jab, jab, right hook. So what I'll do is um, I recently got uh, a six pack. And in fact, um, I could, I could show the, uh, I could show your viewers. Um, You know, if, if anything I set my mind to, I'm going to, I'm going to achieve it. I'm going to make sure that it happens. And so I um, decided that I wanted to uh, be in the best shape of my life this year since I I was turning 41 and, and so I got my six pack. I went from, uh, like around 190 ish pounds, 185 ish pounds down to about 170 ish pounds and got a whole bunch of pictures of me being shredded. And so it's really exciting. (laughs) Now I've gained a few pounds back. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I'm about 175 today. Uh, but that's just how, I go about my life is I try to go all in to say no to uh, Mm. all of these other things to basically budget my time, budget my time. So I'm fully invested and focused on one thing. Uh, So so anyway, uh, I, I, 
I feel like uh, you should you should ask a question. I, I shouldn't stay on a tangent. <laughs> so where do you see yourself going? Now? Yeah, from in, now. In the future? Yeah. Um, What's, what, what are sort of are your aspirations for the future, for the next couple of three years, say? Yeah. So where I am now, I'm quite happy with. Um, to illustrate that a bit, I travel every other week. So, for example, tomorrow I'm leaving for Napa for the week. And then I come home for a few, a few days and then I go back out to St. George for that uh, family reunion. Yeah. And then I come back home and I keep I, I've been to Mexico twice in the last uh, four months. I've been to Utah to visit my family back home uh, six times in in that in the last five months. And, uh, and, and I go skiing on Tuesdays, I go mountain biking, I, I exercise, go to the gym, like, a uh, couple hours out of the day, I'll do my walking, I'll do my steps. Sometimes I'll walk in the morning, sometimes I'll walk it at, at, in the evening, or, uh, I've got treadmill in the office and I've got a treadmill at the house too, if, to get in my steps. Mm -hmm. I'm, I just like, I, I eat well, I eat. I buy my own filet mignon because it's a lot cheaper than going mm. out to dinner and buying a filet mignon. But I, I'll cook like three filets. It's still expensive. It's still 60 bucks to cook three filets. Yeah. But I'll that like my dinner will be three filets and some fresh veggies and some potatoes or some rice. Like I'm just honestly, and I have to say it with just gratitude. I feel like I am where I want to be right now. I feel mm. like I work maybe 20 hours a week in, unless when I'm out of town, like in Napa, I might work like 10 minutes in a day, but, um, I, I work generally a half day on Tuesdays, a full day on Wednesdays, a full day on Thursdays. And that's it. Um, that's all mm. of the hours that I put in and I, with my kids, I spend, as long as unless I'm out of town, when I'm out of town, I don't do this. But on every Wednesday night, we do CrossFit together. Every Thursday night, we do game night together. We just play games every Thursday night. Every Friday, we do movie night. So there's this movie that had just come out called Lightyear from the Toy Story series, Buzz Lightyear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was that just came out this Friday. And the kids, that's what we do. We go to, we either rent a movie or we, we go to a movie. Uh, and on Saturdays we do parkour together and we go hiking. Uh, I don't know. I'm just, I feel like I want my life to be this way in two years from now. I want, I don't want anything mm. to change. I want. You're happy where you are. This is so, this is perfect. What's, for me. What, a sort, what sort of skiing do you do? Are you are you a, a real thoroughbred on skis? Are, are, are you a telemark skier? Uh, I, do, a, I, a, I do. I do some snowboarding down, and I do snowboarding, and I would say I'm just a little above average. So there are some people that can really shred it on the hills. They do jumps and three sixties, and uh, I, I mean, I, I look comfortable but i don't do the scary stuff on my snowboard <laughs> actually but on my mountain bike though and during the summers i i call it trestle tuesday where every tuesday i go to trestle bike park which is a, a ski resort in winter park hmm. and you put your mountain bike on a lift chair and then you get on the lift chair after it and the people, they coming? take off your mountain bike for you, and then they hand it to you when you get off. And it's pretty extreme. I do the double blacks. I do the really, really, really rough stuff that, frankly and truthfully, I would say an average mountain biker could die on. Like, if you're an average mountain biker going down yeah. the stuff that I go down, like, you're likely to break some ribs, break some ankles, break some wrists. Break, break some neck. noses like I did when I was in grade <laughs> school. Uh, you're likely to get hurt um, like bad. 
they're these are mm. they're quite dangerous um but for me it's it's just a ton of fun it's very exciting so i go i go pretty recklessly on the mountain bike i i'm doing jumps i'm i, I might jump like maybe 60 feet like i'll be in the air for 60 feet before the landing and i'll be going off of like just big drops and it's it's pretty extreme to be honest uh mm. so so skiing snowboarding i'm average maybe a little above average like but i'm not good you know i'm not good yeah. i'm i'm not as fast as my younger brother my half brother from my stepdad and my mom not as quick as he is uh i'm not as balanced as he is on a snowboard but uh but on on a mountain bike i could i could do almost anything mm. so you ever tried telemark skiing what's that telemark you must have seen telemark in in colorado no. there it's i don't know what it means skiing. free hill skiing it's, oh it's is like, that like when not... you take a? Uh, is that like when a helicopter brings you up no 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 top? it's uh uh, it's just a different technique. You've got your alpine skis and then you've got telemark. Oh, so you, you, I'll have to just, look it up. Yeah. It's, it's I've heard great... of cross country skiing. Is well, it it's that? a bit like cross country skiing, oh. but you're on sort of alpine type skis and the, the boots are flex a bit better. And uh, oh. it's, it's a different te turning. Technique, Never tried basically. that. Never tried that. I'm not, I've only really skied the, the one time uh and i fell a lot and i <laughs> felt like my knees were gonna break so i did go and take a private one private lesson for about a half an hour um we me and my kids we went for an hour and a half i think we did a 90 minute session but my time was only part of that it was an indoor place called snowbon in colorado that is a giant carpet treadmill uh, with wet carpet that looks it's white and so mm. i practiced skiing there and i got the hang of it but i haven't tried it on the snow i just like snowboarding uh, it's too easy yeah. I, I already own the snowboard I've, i own the boots i own the bindings i own the helmet yeah. it, it, i don't <laughs> i and you're like sitting like, down I, some, i'm like i've got a choice <laughs> of looking like a fool and doing skiing which everybody tells me is supposed to be easier or i can just ride my snowboard and i'm like you know i only go a few times a, a season yeah um and so it's like meh i just i just grab i don't have to go and rent anything i just put my board in my car and drive up to the mountain it's about an hour and a half yeah. i'm in the mountains but the closest ski resort is uh breckenridge and it's like an hour and 20 minutes uh -huh. um so it's like I'll, i can just throw that in head up there Anybody and go. ski for half the day on a tuesday and then uh, work the work for a few more hours on tuesday hmm. fair enough well adam i think you've had quite a go at it <laughs> i appreciate being <laughs> on the show yeah you've done you've done incredibly well from where you've where you've started i mean I, I understand the dyslexia thing. I, I, I have that trouble myself. Um, but, I, but I'm nowhere near as good as maths as you are. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know why I got good at it. I don't, it just seems to make so much sense. It just, yeah. it's just, it's, but just the thing that I was bad at is showing it, showing my work yeah. in geometry and algebra. They were like, show your work. And I'm like, I don't know how to say that. And they're like, well, how did you come to that answer? I said, well, it seemed like it was probably going to be uh, above 15, less than 20. So I plugged in 17. It worked. So that, that's the answer, 17. <laughs> and they're like, that's not work. So, no, I just looked at it. I said, does 15 work? No, it's too small. Does 20 work? No, it's too big. Does 17 work? Oh, yeah, it was 17. So that's all I did. And then I wrote the 17. It took me like two yeah. seconds to do the whole thing. But <laughs> they don't get that. They want to see it all worked out, don't they? Yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway, Adam, thank you so much. I've, I've enjoyed that. That's been really good. Uh, pleasure being on your show. 
You're welcome. Oh, can I say a uh, uh, call to action? We yeah. should do that. If somebody's listening and they want to hear more, they can just go to the podcast on podcasting by Adam Adams. That's me. That's your call to action. Do it. Wicked. You've done <laughs> Wicked. it. Wicked. The Tim Hill Podcasts. Ordinary people's extraordinary stories. 